and he's been hitting her on that, but that's sort of a weak issue because nobody wants money in politics. Uh, the Young Turks has the Wolf Pack, and I think even Mitch McConnell was talking about, how, you know, he was bitching about having money in politics too. So, um, uh, the only thing that I saw that the you know, major uh, policy critical of the issue that I did not like, he's, he's very weak on the war on drugs. He said he was for industrial hemp and he wanted to check out into the studies about marijuana. You're fucking wrong. You don't need to study anything about marijuana. It's, it's way less harmful to you than alcohol. It's stupid. It shows how the adults have been lying to the children for fucking decades. You know, um, it's not a fucking narcotic. It's not a Schedule 1 narcotic. That is a bullshit fucking lie. And, you know, if you don't want to be known as a fucking liar to everybody, just come out against the war on drugs. There's so many problems that are associated with the war on drugs. There's the overpopulated prisons, which have nonviolent offenders. Cops, you know, are there to save your life away from the meth, but they do that by putting charges on you and using violence and punitive, you know, damage. He did say invest in rehab, but, you know, what if, what if the person could be a meth user and be a functional, you know, doctor on, on when he's working, he's meth on free time? I mean, I'm just, it's a hypothetical, but if you could do your job, who gives a shit what you do in your own, the privacy of your own house? So, um, you know, perhaps we should just scrap the war on drugs and start to regulate it like we do with alcohol. It's all over the place anyways. You haven't got rid of the drugs. So instead of going after supply side, uh, the war on drugs, let's go after the demand side. Uh, the demand side is the, uh, why is there such a thirsty demand for drugs? Why are Kentuckians, there's pill billies, there's moonshiners, there's, I mean, you know, the cocaine rings, the bluegrass conspiracy, the marijuana. There's so much fucking illegal activity that's going on in Kentucky. And um, and if the war on drugs was not employed, you know, when you make something illegal, you incentivize the person to actually engage in selling the thing. I can, you know, make a shit ton of money if I try to get me a, a truck from Mexico that has a ton of fucking drugs and shit. If I can get me one truck, man, I'd be set for life, right? There's like millions of dollars in doing something like that. So by making it illegal, you actually create the profit incentive to engage in the illegal activity. It's why prohibition didn't work in uh, our own nation's history with alcohol. All it did was it created Al Capones. It created all these fucking gangsters who made their name for themselves because of prohibition. Joe Kennedy made his name for himself in prohibition. So you have all these fucking gangsters, you know, who make a shit ton of money because the government is trying to make, you know, trying to destroy something, you can't get rid of it. Alcohol, you have to make it. You have to have, like, a still and shit to make it. No, you couldn't even get rid of it. So to think you can get rid of a plant, y'all fucking lying. So I think uh, he needs to come out uh, strongly against the war on drugs. Um, but over besides that, you know, his 10-point plan is more progressive. I trust that when he gets in there, you know, he'll he'll uh, uh, go and um, uh, confront NASA and Patriot Act and FISA and all the things that he talked about. So I very much believe in all of the, um, uh, you know, virtually 90% of the ideas that he's put out there. He's even got this um, thank you delivered at the Marcus Lindsay in Louisville. Uh, every parent listening today knows how exciting it is to see your children mature into thoughtful, poised, successful adults who have not only become adults but also friends. <laughs> so, okay, I, I could read that later. I don't know um, exactly where I'm going with any of that. But uh, I, I'll sift through that. Um, I'm going to mention Burl Farnsley. They called him a perennial candidate. This is the same charge they put on Gatewood Gabbard. I couldn't find any pictures of Burl, so I don't know how hidden this guy is. He ran for mayor two, three, or four years ago. He's uh, Burl Farnsley. I think it's like C. Burl Farnsley. It's Charles. He's like Charles II. Um, Charles Farnsley, Mayor Charlie, was a very popular mayor in Louisville. He was mayor during the Brown versus Board of uh, Education decision in 1954, which is um, actually one year before then. So I don't know if he would have seen the integration, if he moved steps towards it or not. He did start with the funds for the arts. But okay, so Charlie Farnsley was mayor of Louisville from 1948 to 1953, and he lived just three blocks away from some people on Confederate Place, which is known, now known as Unity Place near the Confederate Monument. Maybe by U of L. Um, Charles Farnsley was a true Southern politician, donning the string tie even before we fully embraced Colonel Sanders. So Charles Charles Farnsley had Colonel Sanders tie. His son Burl Farnsley went to the Cochrane grade school with uh, me. This is some guy or somebody wrote online a comment somewhere. I don't even know who it is. 
But he's talking about his son, Burl Farnsley, went to the Cochrane uh, grade school with me. And we played together often at each other's houses. What started me thinking was a notation that Burl Farnsley is running for mayor this year. It was always fun being around Burl Farnsley because his dad was a character and was well-liked so that everywhere we went, people would remark about or ask about his dad and stir, still refer to him as mayor even after he left the office in 1953. He would become uh, went on to become U.S. representative in 1964, but among his accomplishments are the facts that he created Rebin, Rebel Yell Bourbon, marketed by is Uncle Alex Farnsley at Stitzwell Weller Distillery, which was to cash in on the Southern nostalgia. Until 1984, it was only sold south of the Mason-Dixon in limited product production. So, I mean, I don't know if there, you should tie yourself with the fucking Confederates. I mean, the Confederates have been running fucking Kentucky since after the Civil War. You know, even before then, you probably could even make an argument. But the Confederates, you know, they they ran after the Civil War for about 50, 100 years. I think there might even be remnants today, and this kind of shows me that there are. Burl Farnsley, I don't know much about him, but his dad is, um, it seems like he's a Confederate. He's the Rebel Yell Bourbon. He's selling Rebel Yell Bourbon. Um, okay, so let's keep on going. Um, Burl Farnsley was always eccentric and was a student of the philosophies of Thomas Jefferson as well as those of Confucius. So Thomas Jefferson, that's mixture on him, but generally okay, right? Every person's supposed to be free, even if he didn't have free people. And then Confucius, you know, the Confucius has just been um, enticing mankind since he's been around. In 1949, he designed the Louisville City flag, incorporating the fleur de lis for the first time. So, in the Louisville flag, if it's just a plain flag, but it's got this little fucking flower type thing. Um, it's got like a little flower signal. It's a symbol of a flower. It's not a real flower, but like a symbol. It's got like a little swooping thing, and then like a little thing in the middle. It's um, the... Um, it comes from France, and it's like the fleur de lis, and he put it into the fucking uh, flag. So he changed the flag. Louisville's flag was because of this uh, Burl Farnsley's father. So then you have, in the 1960s, uh, Farnsley and the county judge Marlowe Cook. Oh, wait, that could be his dad. Could be his father. It just says Farnsley. So his son. So I think they're talking about Far the the father, Charlie Farnsley. So let's go back. Charlie Farnsley is the one who created Louisville's flag. In the 1960s, Charlie Farnsley and then County Judge Marlo Cook purchased a steamboat known as the Avalon, bringing it back from Cincinnati and refurbishing it and renaming it the Belle of Louisville. The Belle of Louisville became a favorite for teen and college dances and the Louisville groups. Charles Farnsley died in 1990. In his five years as mayor, Charlie Farnsley was credited with modernizing municipal government and proven civic services, easing the city into racial desegregation, which how can you you know brag about easing the city to desegregation? when it's segregated today. He didn't succeed. It's segregated. The most segregated city in all of America is Louisville, Kentucky. And also Louisville, Kentucky is the one that broke Plessy versus Ferguson. We're bringing back Plessy versus Ferguson. We kicked Brown versus the Board of Education out in 2007 with that Supreme Court case. So you can't have integration no more. So whatever. He seems to be a Confederate Southerner sympathizer who might actually be like a decent fucking guy. Um, or, or try to be a decent guy because it says he eased it in. Um, he also promoted local cultural groups like the Louisville Orchestra and the Children's Theater. Mr. Charlie Farnsley was elected to the House of Representatives in 1964, serving for one term. Um, he's an ardent supporter of President LBJ and his Great Society program, so those are good programs. That's the war, um, he declared the uh, war on poverty, right? He went to, he went to uh, Appalachia and went to pull Kentuckians up by their bootstraps. Let's do something. Let's have a great society. Let's declare a war on poverty and let's be different types of people, including um, he supported the 1965 Voting Rights Act, which even Rand Paul doesn't even support, and the creation of the National Endow Endowment for the Arts. He survived by two daughters, Sally Bird of Arlington and Ann Farnsley of VV, Indiana, and three sons, Burl Farnsley, Douglas Farnsley, both of Louisville, and Alexander Farnsley of La Jolla, California, and he has six grandchildren. Um, also, Charlie Farnsley won Kentucky's third district congressional seat, defeating incumbent Marion M. Gene Snyder of the Gene Snyder Freeway, right, of the fucking, the guy who voted against the Civil Rights Act, which is just like Rand Paul. He was later elected to the House from an adjoining district, Farnsley, 
Served in the House from January 3rd, 1965 through January 3rd, 1967. He did not seek re-election. He's a member of the Society of Colonial Wars and the Sons of Confederate Veterans. So being, you know, he's got some nostalgia, some fucking Confederate veteran, like, tie in with him. Um, so it's hard to say that he was totally fucking just, you know, clean of, of racism. He lived, um, he lived on Confederate place. Near the Confederate Monument, he was selling Rebel Yell bourbon. Rebel Yell. Ah, Rebel Yell. Um, and the, bit, the last big thing that he did was bring the Fund for the Arts to Louisville, which helped creating him a statue. There's a statue of Charlie Farnsley just leaning on there and like just talking. And he's bald, and it's like a bronze statue on a park bench. So that's, that's uh, Charlie Farnsley, and so if his dad gives you any indication of who Burl is, if that's okay to judge, it's not okay to judge the, the, father, the son by the father. It gives you an indication, it gives you the roots, but sometimes they can follow in their father's footsteps or wildly divert, you know. So, I don't know, hopefully he's not a fucking confederate fucker, hopefully he's not a racist piece of shit, hopefully... Um, He's still for LBJ's Great Society program. So basically take all the good things from his father. Let's keep those. And all the bad things, let's destroy those. So I don't know much about Burl Farnsley. But if he's a perennial candidate, he needs to get his voice out there. Because I cannot find your name in any article, any newspaper, anywhere. I haven't read a speech. I couldn't find a YouTube video. There, you're conspicuously absent um, on the internet. Even Tom Rechtenwald, the businessman, the old old Tom Rechtenwald has found the internet and he's putting his issues out there just like Fred Tuttle did. And um, and we're going to get to Tom Rechtenwald here in a second. Hi, I'm Tom Rechtenwald and I want to become Kentucky's next U.S. Senator. Kentucky's primary election will be held Tuesday, May 20th, and my name will be on the ballot as a Democrat. Now this is going to be a 9 or 10 minute video, so please see it until the end. I think we can all agree that Congress is broken. And it's going to remain broken as long as we continue to elect only those candidates who have been able to raise millions and millions of dollars in campaign donations from wealthy individuals and special interest groups. It stands to reason that those people who give all that money are going to want something in return. And it also stands to reason that those who accepted all those dollars are going to have to take care of their wealthy friends first. You and I, average everyday Kentuckians, will come in second every time. I think I have a better idea. I want to become known as the senator whose vote cannot be bought. I won't accept even one dollar in campaign donations. That way, I won't have to answer to the wealthy folks and special interest groups. I will be able to vote from my heart. And first in my heart will be those average, everyday Kentuckians who are struggling to stay in the middle class and those who are struggling to get there. I'm the only candidate who is one of you and who truly understands your plight. Now, I don't expect you to vote for me just because I'm not taking campaign donations. No, let me demonstrate my leadership skills to you. Back in 1990, when I was working at Naval Ordnance Station in Louisville, our base was placed on an arbitrary base closure list. We decided we weren't going to take that sitting down. We befriended Congressman Ron Mazzoli, who agreed to host a breakfast in our nation's capital and invite several influential folks there to try to impress the right people. He also insisted that we send someone who could represent the rank and file employees at Naval Ordnance. I was approached by upper management and union leadership to be that person. I think I did a good job and I'm very proud of it. I went up there, I gave a speech in front of this many influential people, Kentucky Governor Wallace Wilkinson, Mayor for Life Jerry Abramson, Judge Executive David Armstrong, Congressman Ron Mazzoli, Senators Wendell Ford, Mitch McConnell, Les Aspen, the chairman of the Armed Services Subcommittee, and several other congressmen from Kentucky and Southern Indiana. The most important of those was Les Aspen, the chairman. We were able to impress upon him the importance of saving naval ordinance. That day, he initiated legislation that ultimately resulted in our removal from that base closure list. 
And, and a couple of days later, this grapevine came out at Naval Ordnance. It typically came out once a week. And on there, it listed some accolades for me. It says, Tom Rechtenwall, representing Local Lodge 830, made an eloquent speech suggesting that closure of the ordnance station would be a great mistake. I'm proud of that recognition. Now, we weren't safe after that time. It seemed like every year or two, our name would end up on another base closure list.